And if you've ever watched any tutorials on YouTube for magic, you've probably seen something by MissMag822. So we're going to do a trick by him today, or from his channel. For this trick, we're going to give the deck a nice fair ripple shuffle. We'll give it another one as well, just for good measure. And then all we need, actually, is the core cards. Uh, we grab them out as fast as possible from the deck. Uh, that's a bunch there. 12 core cards. Probably should have done this beforehand, but I might be slightly stupid. So we'll just grab them out now. Here we go. Uh, there's two kings there. A queen. And is that everything? Perfect. 12 court cards from a shuffled deck of playing cards. Now all you need to do for this is take them in pairs. So if we have a black queen and a red jack, we place those on the table. Then we take the next two. The red king, black queen. Place those. The black jack, red king. And then... Uh, Red Queen, Black Jack, and the last two, a Black King, Red Queen. You place them all on the table. You snap the fingers, and gone from a completely shuffled deck, all mixed up, they're now completely in order once again. So, we've actually got two Black Kings, two Red Queens, two Black Jacks, two Red Kings, two Black Queens, and two Red Jacks, completely in order from a shuffled deck of playing cards. That's the trick for day 101. Let's get started with the questions. Welcome to day 101. It is technically the day I should be filming day 102 because once again I'm slightly behind, just getting really busy with things and editing and our life and everything, having a lot of fun doing stuff. But you know, we're getting there slowly but surely. It is now 1:30 in the afternoon and uh, it's Q&A. I know, exciting, right? But I actually have lots of questions and I really want to answer them all, so I thought I'd do a video regardless if people want to know or not. <laughs> um, I find it very interesting and I might as well share it with you all. Anyway, there is construction happening just over here, so if it is too loud, well, the whole video is not going to be out here. But let's get started with questions. I've never done a Q&A, this is very weird. All right, here we go. From the revolutionary guy, Ollie, one of my very great friends from Wellington, New Zealand. He asks, third favorite color, I don't know. My favorite color is purple. Maybe orange? Cyan, like turquoise blue or something. No, orange is probably second, so maybe like turquoise blue. I think is my third favorite color. There we go, we got there. For Isaac, another uh, magician friend from Wellington, New Zealand, before I moved. Has street magic been more enjoyable, more rewarding since you moved? So since I moved to Sydney from New Zealand. Um, yes. Okay, so there's two things here. There's street magic and there's street performing. Street magic is when I go out and don't do it for money and I'm trying to, I, I usually film it. Um, and that's like close-up magic just for a few people at a time. So that has been more rewarding because I never really did street magic in New Zealand. So I'm definitely way happier that I'm doing it. I can share what I love with people and, um, you know, hopefully give people an enjoyable moment that they can remember. My hair is going... Oop, I just dropped my phone. My hair is going everywhere. This is ridiculous. The wind. In terms of street magic, has it been more enjoyable? Um, I've definitely done better shows in Australia than I did do in New Zealand and I've learned a lot more while street performing in Australia than I did do in New Zealand. Partially because I'm with Jason, partially because I can experience all these other street performers, especially at places like Adelaide Fringe and stuff. So has it been more enjoyable? I think so, yes. Um, I would love to go back now with like the more experience that I have. I'm in no way experienced and I'm in no way very good, but I would love to go back now and see how I actually do street performing in Wellington. And there's a bunch of other places in New Zealand I'd love to street perform as well. So yeah, enjoyable, yes. All right, I'm just gonna sit on a messy bed and answer more questions. How did you get started in magic? Well, I did. I watched a video when I was about 15, I think, learned a trick on YouTube, and that was my entire starting into magic. From there, I just performed very basic tricks in high school and stuff, and I'll probably make a video at some point detailing one of the first tricks I ever learned. I don't even know if I remember it, so yeah, watched a video and got started. Never put down a deck of cards after that, really. From Dominic Miles, another great magician friend of mine, would you ever want to write a magic book? Holy damn, that's a big question, and I have no idea. I think I would, I would love to write a magic book, but I don't think I have anything to necessarily contribute. Not now, especially. God, no, I'm still learning. Like, it would be a great accomplishment to write a magic book. Let me sum that up. Would I want to write a magic book? Yes. Do I think I have the material to write a magic book? No. So a few people have asked how I uh, met Jason Marr and how I kind of have become under his tutelage and his friend and all that. So uh, I basically met Jason and Josh Nobito and pretty much Doug Con all at the same time via the Magic Guys, which is their podcast, when they had a Patreon. And we used to do a like video call once or twice a month for the Patreon. Jason was 
on a cruise, he was working on a cruise ship, and he came into Auckland, which is at the other end of like the North Island from where I lived, but he pulled into Auckland in New Zealand and was like, hey, like he messaged me and was like, hey bro, I'm in Auckland, I don't know where you are, but do you want to meet up for the day? So I literally took a 12 hour bus, I have a video of it, um, I took a 12 hour bus from Wellington overnight to Auckland, when I met Jason, hung out with him for the whole day, and we basically were talking about street performing and stuff and how I should street perform in the school holidays in Sydney or something. And by the end of the day, it was like, oh, you should just move over to Sydney. So I was like, oh yeah, perfect idea. Three months later, I moved over to Sydney. So very spontaneous. Just tacking on to the question of how I met Jason, there's another question here asking, why did I move from uh, New Zealand to Australia or what made me move? And it was street performing. Jason was like, well, let's street perform in Sydney. Holidays, yep, good idea. And then it was like, oh, might as well just move over. What trick fooled you or a trick you still don't know how it works? Off the top of my head, I'm not sure I can give an answer. There is definitely been like heaps of magic that are, uh, you know, still fools me, but I also have inklings of how some aspects of it work. Um, there's a lot of magic that also, like, doesn't fool me. I can pretty much follow along with it. So obviously, if a magician wanted to fool a magician, they would make a trick basically called a magician fooler. A magician fooler basically relies on the fact that you're performing to a magician. They already know what moves you're doing if you're doing moves. So you kind of use slights as red herrings or just things to throw them off done in subtle ways that would throw a magician off and probably not make much sense to a layman. So magician foolers is a weird category of magic sometimes. In terms of just general tricks that have fooled me, off the top of my head. Like there's some beautiful routines, like Teller's Rose routine, I believe. It's, it's such a nice routine and I don't need to know how it's done. I'm never going to perform it. So I guess you could say those kind of things have fooled me. I can still enjoy watching magic because I can appreciate the skill and everything behind it. Whereas a layman might enjoy magic because of that uh, fooling or magic feeling. From Jeremy Tan, who is an amazing magician once again, what is the hardest thing of daily vlogging, the real struggle? Um, right now, the hardest thing while I'm in Newcastle is that I have so many cool, amazing people around me, like my roommates who are bartenders and everything, and have so many great stories that we just end up chatting till like 4 a.m. And I basically don't have time to then edit. I can't sit in front of my computer. I will literally fall asleep if I'm trying to edit. So that is the struggle right now, finding the time to do it. When I'm in Sydney, I'm basically just working on myself the entire time. So I'm street performing and then I'm videoing and then I'm editing and that's like all I do. But here, I really want to take in the experience and spend time with people. So that is the struggle while I'm in Newcastle. In Adelaide, it was a little bit easier. I was with Jason. We could film together and do things together and then kind of help each other make stories and that kind of stuff. So it was definitely easier easier to film in Adelaide, especially because I also had a lot of street performers to film. So that was just footage I could dump in a video and then I have a video. Maho, it's difficult to film. Otherwise, the real struggle for me in the 365 has actually been the magic tricks. Like I had a certain amount of repertoire for the first, I think, two months that I was like pretty solid with doing. And there are still tricks that I haven't done in the 365 yet because I'm saving them so I don't just blast through all of my A material and the first three or four months or whatever, but right now I'm struggling a little bit, especially while in Newcastle to find new tricks and stuff. Favorite cardistry move? Well, the cardistry move I do the most often is stag cut. This cut here, which is a little difficult to do when you have to hold the cards up to the camera, but you can get a nice like hot shot out of it. Uh, backdrop, which is that move there, is also something I do often, as well as like, you know, Charlier's. In terms of favorite stag cut, it's probably my favorite packet cut, and then I think my favorite flowy move is pincho, which is this one which I kind of have a little variation on where I dump these cards and then I can make this card and backdrop it and yeah so stag cut and then pincho for packet cut and like a flowy almost one-handed move so raise rise how long before it looked good I would say a year <laughs> that was me practicing it like very on and off um, it wasn't until I actually got consistent at it that I was like oh I can do this and you know like now I'm good at it but it took me quite a while, I, probably not a year, but it took me quite a while to be able to like consistently be able to rise cards through the layers of the deck and make it look good, make it look good and understand the angles and everything. Being able to do the slight on the fly in, in a performance situation feels great and that took quite a while to actually gain the confidence to do. I think the first few times I ever actually performed Raise Rise, it was on video. Uh, well, I like filmed it a lot, but then I actually performed it for people via like a Zoom call and that gave me more confidence to perform it because I could control my angles in that situation because I it's a stationary camera and then that got me more comfortable doing it. So then 
now I can do it in real life as well. What music do you listen to? Favorite band, song? Um, I listen to quite a lot of genres of music. My Spotify playlist is an absolute mess. Um, some of like the funky music that I like listening to is a trio called AJR. It's just kind of weird music and I very much enjoy listening to it. Went to their concert, that was great. I listen to most genres, I listen to rock, rap. I've been listening to a lot of DMB because my flatmates listen to it, which is actually really great. How old were you when you decided being a magician is what you wanted to be? I have no idea. For most of my time throughout high school, so from 13 to 18, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Um, it wasn't until I started doing magic that I was like, oh, maybe this is what I want to do, but I never actually considered it technically is a viable career because I was in New Zealand, I lived in a small town, I had no connections. I So just for reference, I didn't have any magician friends for the first three years of doing magic and I've only been doing magic about six years. So magic was not was always something that I think I wanted to do in the back of my mind, but, but there was never a obvious attainable goal to be able to do it as a career. Does that make sense? Until I finally kicked my ass in gear and started street performing. Despite quite not knowing how to go about becoming a magician, whenever I would pose the question in my head of, oh, what do I want to do or oh, I could I could go to uni and I could study instantly my brain would pop back to or you could do magic it kind of just stuck in my head the entire time whenever I would think about careers how long did you practice your sleight of hand before you started to perform in front of people um well different slights takes different amount of time there's some slights that I just don't perform in people because they're just fidget moves uh, most of the slights I do use are very standard stuff double lifts double undercuts passes uh, you know, a control of some sort. Like, you don't need to get super fancy sometimes. I like to focus on the performance and presentation. How long does it take nowadays? Uh, I have no idea. I kind of just do a slight and then I'm like, oh, well, to actually perform this, I have to do it for someone. And I just do it. And I either screw it up or I do it. This is what I'm going to say. Practice it until you feel comfortable, but don't restrict yourself to practicing it so much that you never actually perform it. You're be better off, honestly, just performing a slight and understanding how your hands work when you're actually performing it in the real world because there's so many factors that go into it and not in a controlled, comfortable practicing scene environment. Uh, since when am I a professional magician? Well, I'm a street performer, so I'm still learning to street perform and I'm still trying to make money through that and everything. And now, well, now I'm working at Maho, so I have a full contract for six weeks, which is amazing. And that's only happened since I moved to Sydney in December at the end of 2022 there. Before that, I had a full-time job living in Wellington. I managed a cafe. I was a barista so, since December 2022. Plan to visit Vietnam? Yeah, I would love to. I'd love to do more travel and I really want to, but right now I'm very focused on building my career as a magician, I guess. And I can't just go blow all of my money on travel, even though I want to. What magician inspired me the most? I have a lot of inspirations these days of like some street performers. So obviously like Gazzo, um, Alexander Osborne, Doug Conn, Jason Ma, Sergio, Stephen Bridges. Those are street performer names. Um, otherwise like people like Josh Nobito have been a real help to me. Brendan Dooley have been an amazing help to me. All of these people have been an incredible inspiration and encouraging force in my journey into magic. Otherwise, like bigger names, I guess I used to watch Dynamo a lot on TV. Never, I have still never to this day watched David Blaine's street magic specials. I know, I know, I should. I should do that maybe for a video. Can I do that? Are they available anywhere? Let's maybe do that. But I used to watch Dynamo a lot on TV because those specials were kind of coming out when I was growing up. So I've actually gone and seen Dynamo's live show. So he's an inspiration. People like David Williamson. I really love David Williamson's style. Um, Daryl, Daryl Martinez, Juan Tamariz, Darren Brown, Paul Harris, and probably a million other names that I can't quite think of right now. Okay, this is a weird question. When I'm at a restaurant and I say I'd like to substitute broccoli for carrots, am I getting rid of the broccoli or the carrots? Yeah, okay, so you're getting rid of broccoli and you're asking for carrots. I'd like to substitute this broccoli for carrots. Nailed it. English is difficult. What cards do you prefer for magic? Not like brand name, but like do you prefer plastic paper or paper cards coated with plastic? You can use any playing cards for magic. You don't need bicycle playing cards for magic. Uh, for a solid amount of time, I lived in New Zealand and I couldn't get my hands on bicycle cards. I was 15, I didn't used to buy playing cards online. So for a solid maybe one or two years in my magic journey, I never used bicycle cards or any good playing cards. I just used whatever was around the house, bridge size and poker size, the two different sizes of cards there, slightly wider and slightly thinner. I actually have a video, it's kind of old at this point, so I might remake it at some point about talking about the quality of playing cards and does it affect things much. So you can go watch that right here if you'd like. 
My preferences, of course, is like, you know, high quality cards printed by like USPCC. Bikes are really good because they are the cheapest around pretty much. I don't know of a better option. So yeah, anything printed by USPCC, some of Cardamundi stock. You can get really heavy into it. A deck of cards is a deck of cards to me. I can use pretty much anything and I'll be happy to do so. I'm not too picky. What is a typical hat for you at the moment? Wow. Well, basically before moving to Australia, I pretty much never wore hats and I only wore a beanie sometimes. And then the beanie was only like a recent thing in the last year or two that I actually started wearing hats. Otherwise, as soon as I got to Australia, yeah, the hat that you have seen quite often and that I wear in almost every street show is this. When I got to Australia and started street performing, Jason said I needed a hat and this has been it. It's done a lot of street shows with me. It's held a lot of money. It is, uh... It's a crushable hat so I can have a lot of fun with like picking things up and being like gone and stuff and those are little bits I love in my show so I'm slowly learning to spin this hat as well. Um, that was a terrible example. I believe this is actually a fedora. It's a very nice hat. It's a Stanton classic and uh, it's 100% wool so great hat. Moving on. Putting together things like shows and routines, well I think the best way to do it is to just put the routine together in a structure that you think suits, um, get as much advice from people as possible, and try keep the connections between tricks like flowing. They don't need to all obviously like relate one after the other to each other, but you need like a transition line or something to say or something that relates just to keep the show moving, otherwise it's kind of just like trick, stop, trick, stop, trick, stop, which I think is where it gets a little bit jumpy and bad, in my opinion. Obviously I'm not a professional at this, I've only ever created one half an hour stage show and my street show is a little bit different to doing a normal stage show because you do a lot of audience interaction in a street show to build the crowd and everything. So it's a little bit different and I can't comment too much on it, but I hope that helps. As for routine in general, whether you know it's right or not, just go and perform it. Chances are if you've created a routine, no matter how much time you put into it, it's probably going to suck when you first do it. I find the best way for me to do a routine is to craft it to a standard that I'm pretty happy with and comfortable performing, then just go and perform it. And I'll realize, oh, that didn't flow right. Oh, that sucked. Oh, that sucked. Oh, that sucked. And you just keep doing it over and over and over and you find what works and what doesn't work. I hope that works. Helps. Tutorial lol. Well, I don't know. I really like teaching, but I don't know if I want to make tutorials because my channel has never revolved around them before. I just can't make my mind up. So maybe one day. Not holding myself to anything though. Nothing against them though. To get a little bit more specific with the, uh, to get a little bit more specific with how I create routines, someone's asking about how I would make a street show, the order of the tricks you're gonna do. I think you gotta find some material that you're comfortable with and then put it in order of um, how the tricks play to an audience. Like, so if you wanna draw them in close first, where you're doing like a nice small close trick for the few people that you draw in. And then as you build your crowd bigger, the tricks get bigger as the show progresses. Um, the finales get bigger of each trick. You also don't wanna make the ending of a trick that's in the middle of your show too big of a finale, because otherwise people will probably leave. And then that obviously takes away from your full finale at the very end of your show. I'm, I still have a lot to learn about street performing and a lot to learn about putting shows together and everything. So take my advice with a grain of salt, but I hope it helps a little bit. Would I rather fight 100 duck-sized horses or 100 horse-sized ducks? Holy damn. Well, do they still have the power of a normal horse? Horse-sized ducks would be scary. I'm gonna say 100 horse-sized ducks purely because horses' hooves hurt and horses' teeth hurt as well. So ducks don't have teeth and they have floppy feet. Bonus. <laughs> What is the best opening card trick in my opinion? Well, I'm constantly working on the idea of opening tricks as well. I think uh, short and snappy and something to the point that kind of demonstrates a little bit of skill as well would be really good. Um, in terms of what I probably do, like a quick color change in their hand is really good. Yeah, for card tricks, I would say a quick color change in, in the spectator's hands is really good. Any magic done in their hands is really good. And if it's short, snappy, and to the point to get things like kicking off straight away, that would be the best way of doing it for an opener. What is my favorite magic trick to perform? That is a difficult question. It would probably depend on the genre, and even then I don't know if I could answer that. Like in card magic, like I really like doing raise rise, but it's not something that I perform all of the time. Um, it's just something I can do and enjoy doing, and it definitely doesn't get like the best, I can do better tricks that get better reactions, but that doesn't mean they're my favorite. Hmm. 
My favorite magic trick to perform, I'm really enjoying doing a chop cup and build to lemon or build to lime. That is a really great routine and I'm having a lot of fun doing it. I've come up with a few lines that I'm quite happy with and the routine is slowly evolving into something of my own. So probably chop cup. Do I plan to stay in Oz long term or move back to New Zealand? Um, probably Oz. I have no idea what's happening after Maho Magic Bar and my stint in Newcastle. I'll probably be going back to Sydney and street performing. And I really want to make street performing like my thing. I very much enjoy it. It's absolutely fantastic. And I just want to learn to get really good at it. It gives me a lot of confidence in every other aspect of my life. And to do so, the easiest way to street perform full time. Well, it's a numbers game at the end of the day. So any bigger country is better. To put it into perspective, the population of Sydney is bigger than the entirety of New Zealand. So a numbers game, and I really want to street perform in like Melbourne and stuff as well, so I'll definitely be sticking in Australia for quite a while, I think. However, on that note, I do very much miss New Zealand, and I'll have a lot of friends and family over there that I would love to visit often as possible. I think that was my most amount of bottle flips ever. I think that was four, almost five. Would you try performing the chop cup on the streets and since performing it in the magic bar, do you think it gets a better reaction than card magic? That's a great question. Well, I actually have been performing chop cup on the street. It's what I was transitioning into from doing three cups just before coming to Maho. Maho just gives me a lot of time to focus on the chop cup and really get it down so I can bring it back on the streets, which is amazing. In terms of does it get better reactions than card magic? I would say for kids, definitely, because it's a lot more visual and it's easier to follow than a like card trick that they have to remember a card and remember where it is in the deck and blah, 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 blah. Card tricks, kids, not that great. Chop cup, way better. Does it get better reactions? Um, there's a few lines that I've like come up with for the chop cup that is really hitting well quite a lot of the time and I'm really enjoying doing it, um, but I can get decent reactions out of both. It, out of both. it kind of just depends on the audience sometimes. Am I going to become full-time with YouTube if possible? Um, like, it would always just be another source of income because even if I did start making enough money from it, I would still want to street perform and I would still want to do magic. So it would just be like multiple sources of income, I assume. Um, you know, it's not like a be-all end goal or anything and I may s mostly make videos to document everything for myself so I can see it all. But hopefully you guys get something out of it as well. I appreciate everybody for watching and supporting and I'm just going to continue making them regardless of how it pans out. Was there a moment you knew you wanted to be a magician? Uh, if you mean professionally, I don't know if there was quite a moment that I was like, this is what I want to do. It was just always in the back of my mind whenever I was thinking of, oh, what I should do with my life and I could never come up with an answer except magic. So kind of just throughout like high school and then afterwards. How long have I been performing magic? Uh, six, coming on seven years, I think. I think I started when I was 15. I'm 22 this year, so six or seven years, roughly. Um, performing very much on and off, learning magic for seven years. The last four months, I think, have been the most amount of performing I've ever done in that entire seven years, which is kind of crazy and ridiculous to think about, but there were times that I never used to perform, and um, I want to address that all in a separate video at some point, though. As for occupations outside of magic, um, I never really had an idea. I've commented on it before, answering some other questions, that I basically had no idea what I wanted to do, and magic always kind of fell into my mind every time I thought about it. But if there was one thing I would do, it was probably teaching. I very much enjoy teaching. Um, I just don't like the school system to teach enough in it, and I don't know what else I teach. I coached gymnastics for five years, but I don't think I would do that professionally. Maybe I teach magic one day. Otherwise, Shoba has a few more questions. Uh, besides magic, do you have any other hobbies? I mean, I've been picking up like a ton of different hobbies lately. I can solve Rubik's Cube, which is kind of magic related, but also completely not because I don't do any Rubik's Cube magic. Um, bottle flaring is very addictive. Whoa. So is things like Kendama, juggling, now Dapo Star, which I own one all of a sudden. Um, video editing and making videos, I've been doing that for quite a few years now. Um, I like camping, hiking, walking, I've done parkour, I've done gymnastics, I've done climbing, I've, what else, badminton, volleyball, badminton I really like, um, trampolining, I enjoy swimming, but that's just kind of swimming. I enjoy working out, calisthenics. Actually kind of listening to all them, was uh, a lot of things to talk about. Huh. Reading books. I read a lot of fiction books. I should read more non-fiction, but fiction books are great.
The question of something I'm proud of that I don't often get to mention is a very difficult question for me to answer. I've been sitting here for like 10 minutes racking my brain. I think most things that I'm very proud of or that I'm happy that I've done recently in life have been documented on video and otherwise I can't think. So thank you for the question. If I ever think of a reply, I will reply to that comment. But uh, that, was a, that was a very good question that I cannot answer. Favorite sleight of hand move to practice. Um, well, that's raise rise. That's easy. Whose idea was the 365 Jason's or mine? Um, well actually it was originally done I don't know about like the whole 365 magic concept Um, it's probably been done by other genres of like skill stuff before but it was originally done I believe by like Eric Leclerc and Kayla Morelli are the two big names that I know of that have done it like years and years ago Eric Leclerc is still all over the internet which you can go and watch. It's great Jason attempted it a few years ago and he stopped at about day 130 eight or something like that and then at the end of 2022 me and him were like oh should we do a 365 yeah what a good idea that's a bit of zero planning required and so we just started and we went and bought the zv1 which is what i'm filming on right now and that was basically the journey into starting the 365 both of us together at the same time and it's been really great it's been really great having that support of just back and forth between two people to do a 365 challenge because this is incredibly difficult sometimes what steps should you take to start performing for strangers and how? Um, well, the most most advice people would probably give you is to start performing for friends and family. Now, that advice is good if you want to perform for your friends and family. I had problems where I didn't want to do that because that scared me as well. And like I said, I'm going to make an entire video on this whole performance anxiety thing that, like, from my perspective and my experience. But if you really want to perform for strangers, I recommend getting a few of your friends together. Even if they don't do magic, just all go and hang out. You feel a lot more confident and comfortable when you're hanging out with friends. And then you can uh, try and approach strangers if you'd like to. Um, people sitting down in like a park and just chilling out in general will probably be a lot easier to approach than stopping people walking. Because chances are they've got somewhere to go. Otherwise, just take every opportunity. If someone mentions something about hobbies or interests, you can mention you do magic. And then you can maybe be like, oh, would you like to see a trick? Or maybe they will ask. And just take every opportunity to perform. No matter how scary it is, I think the more you do it, the better you get. Um, and chances are it's going to be scary a lot of times. Like, it's still kind of scary for me sometimes. I still get nervous doing a lot of things. Just take it really easy. Don't worry about screwing up. And you can literally just be like, oh, hey, this is like my first time performing this, or I'm super nervous performing this, so I might screw it up, but would you like to see it, or can I show you it? Who knows, if it goes well, then you feel amazing. If it doesn't go well, you can learn from that and understand what didn't work, what did work, and then the next time you do it, you've just got to do it again. That is the key. You can't do it once. You've got to keep doing it. All right, we're almost there. A few more questions. It's a bit of an interesting question. What type of person was I in school? Um, social enough, but not popular. Uh, sometimes introverted, sometimes extroverted, a little bit of everything. When I started magic in high school, I wanted to perform all the time and then I slowly stopped performing. But whether that had anything to do with growing up or not, I have no idea. I'm just maturing more as I progress through high school. Do you know any gambling moves? And if you do, what's the most difficult one you know? Not really. I can do like a table riffle shuffle, which isn't difficult at all. And I can do like a running ladder cut, which is like a false cut. Um, otherwise, I've like dabbled with riffle stacking a tiny bit. I can probably stack like three or four cards on top of one card, but I don't know how smooth or natural it looks. I've dabbled with like false shuffles like the zero and the push through and I'm, it's not a style that I ever actually perform because I'm never in a real situation that I would perform. I could do it at the bar, but again, it's you, you don't really get the angles of everyone being able to see the table. So gambling magic in Maho isn't even that good. So it's not really something I perform, which means the slights I learn are very like put on the side and they're just whenever I want to fiddle, I guess, on the table or something and I can do a couple of things and just slowly practice it. So they might get better and better over time, but it's not something I real focus on or even study. Um, I have a few really good friends like Caleb Simpson and Dominic Miles who really do study that kind of stuff and they're pretty good. I can, however, second deal and bottom deal reasonably well, I think. You know, I'm pretty happy with what my deals look like, so those are the two I do. But again, I don't really study all the different grips and all the different techniques for it. I kind of just did it so that I'm comfortable doing it. What is my hat line? My hat line is ever-changing, and for a while it was really sh for a while it didn't even exist in my show um, which is actually really important if you want to make money from street performing a hat line is so crucial and mine is 
slightly scripted but it's not fully scripted right now and I'm still kind of working out on it. It basically goes along the lines of um, I introduce myself, I say my age because I'm young street performing so I kind of think that helps sometimes. I basically let the audience know that um, they don't have to feel pressured to give me money but if they'd like to support me they can. Um, diving specific into amounts and giving a little bit of an idea of how much is like appropriate is also really good. It gives people a frame of oh, this person might actually be worth this instead of just dropping in 20 cents into a hat. Who's been your favorite audience member? That's a difficult question. I've had a lot of people come up to me after street shows and stuff and be like, oh my God, that was amazing. That was incredible. Thank you very much, blah, blah, blah. So I get some really nice comments sometimes and it really warms my heart a lot. It feels great. Um, there was one time recently at Maho actually that someone came like two nights in a row and she was like very much into the magic and very much enjoyed everything. So it was absolutely fantastic to see someone um, coming to Maho like two nights in a row and enjoying the magic so much, um, which was really great. So probably that person. What have you learned so far in these 101 days of daily posts? Um, that posting a video every single day is incredibly difficult. I'm, I'm always tired. Um, what have I learned? That's such a big question. Now I have to think. As much as I want to document the process and everything, I try not to just shove a camera in every situation. I'm still trying to live in the moment as much as possible, I think, which I think is really important when you're documenting everything, because otherwise the experiences become disingenuous and it's not so much then about the experiences, it's literally just about the video. And sometimes it is about the video, I do things just for video sometimes, but all the most of the chaos and stupidity that you see on video is me normally. Um, you know, like, and this kind of stuff. I, I did that in my street show and all that before I put it on video. And I do stupid stuff that's never been on video. Being genuine, as genuine as possible on camera, talking to a camera, learning all that kind of stuff is probably what I've learned from 101 days of filming. Finding the balance between working and then like filming and trying to live life. Like there are days that I'm like, I can't be bothered filming anything. So you've got to balance it. It's difficult not easy. I can't wait to look back on this in a year's time or at the end of the year or you know even me looking back on the videos I've already made for the 365. It's it's great to see the progress and the documentation of everything which is why I do it. I'm documenting so that's it. If you had to do one trick for the rest of your life what would it be? Uh, can I class that as two tricks? Um, damn it. I don't know. What is the one trick? I could technically cheat and say I could want to do like an ambitious card because ambitious card covers a lot of different presentations and like ways of revealing cards and that kind of stuff. So yeah, I could say ambitious card and then I can put raise rise in that. <laughs> um, no, a trick. Um, I don't know if I'd want it to be a card trick. I think if I was to do a trick for the rest of my life, this question would have to apply to a trick that I already performed. So chop cup, bill and lime, bill and lemon. Like something fun, something memorable, phantom dick. Ah, oh, there's so much, I don't know. So all the material I just named is just material that I'm already performing consistently. But, um, that's a hard question. L drop in the comments what would be one trick you guys would perform for the rest of your lives, because that is a hard question to answer. I don't want to rule anything out, that's it. The hardest part of your journey to becoming the magician you are today? <sighs> Performance anxiety? Definitely. I haven't talked much about this and I want to make a separate video about it, but performance anxiety. That's all I'm going to leave it as for now and I will be making a video in the future about this because it is something I have struggled with, believe it or not, and it's only the last year that things have gotten really good in terms of performing for me in a future video. Thank you very much for the question. What challenging magic trick do you still aspire to learn? Uh, it's not necessarily a specific magic trick, but it's just the genre of being able to pick up almost anything and do a trick or something with it. So like coin magic is something that I'm constantly diving back into often. Um, and I don't perform a whole lot of coin magic, but there are tricks I can do and can perform and I'm having a lot of fun learning things. Um, there's, I really want to make an entire like set around not using cards so that, you know, I could technically do a gig without a deck of cards. That would be great. That is what I aspire to learn. And when are you gonna go start a Patreon? Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe I start a membership. 
Uh, I don't know if I have anything of value to add, so maybe I just chuck it up. We'll see. Favorite magic products, books, tricks, downloads. Are playing cards a product? Yeah, playing cards. I think I've done it. I think I've answered every single question. This video is actually really all right, camera battery died, but thank you very much everybody for all of the amazing questions. This was actually a very difficult video for me to perform, for, perform, for me to film. My brain kind of gets jumbled up and I have to think a lot like this. Um, I didn't quite realize how difficult this would be to think of these answers to some of these questions, especially because some of these are very thought provoking. This is a long video, I know, I've edited it, I just need to add this last clip to it. And uh, well, I hope you got something out of it. Again, if you have any more questions, drop them in the comments and I will reply. But otherwise, if you made it to this end part of the video half an hour later, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in day 102. Time to catch up.